Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Colleen. I see Donna Blakesley is on the call and um, I've got a list of people that we are going to have speak uh, very quickly, less than two minutes a piece. Um, William, did you want to say some things on behalf of um, hair salons across our county or SQUIM? Oh. You're on mute. Go. Is that better? Yes. Great. Yes, I would. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any any other business owners want to say something? Yes, I would. Okay. And Dan, tell me who you're with. Uh, I own Just Fix It, and my wife owns Peninsula Awards. Okay, great. And so you're in SQUIM? Correct. Okay. I'm trying to give opportunities throughout the county, so... I'm looking, I've got a lot of West End and a lot of Squim, so I'm going to look for a couple, in case we run out of time, uh, look for some folks from um, Port, the Port Angeles area as well. Hey, Colleen. Yes. Do we have anybody that's going to be on the call today that are representing the churches or businesses that have large groups like uh, the symphony? Uh, no, um, I, we, so this was all started by a few restaurant owners and retailers. And so they really want to focus it there and put the attention on that for this one. Then we're doing another, um, the, around, you know, the clown cares steering committee work. And so I think that will be in that, uh, in a later date. It could be late, even later this week or early next week. It doesn't have to be on a Wednesday. But we're trying to, because um, we're trying to focus it a bit right now on retailers, service providers, and um, restaurant owners. Okay. Uh, because, you know, I work with CPAs. I work with small yep. restaurants. I work with the medical profession, you know, and, and they're all trying to figure out how they can keep me employed, <laughs> you know, right. or, or come back to work um, sure. and and still be able to get their businesses open. Yeah, I totally understand that, Deborah. And so it was the legislators asked that they speak directly to the business owners. And, you know, I think there's so much they, you know, I can tell them too things we're hearing. But again, this was they wanted to hear directly from business owners. Okay, well, I sent out the email to uh, to every one of my clients hoping okay. that they would you know, jump on, but I haven't seen any. If you see any, any that uh, pop up there, let me know. Um, I'm going to try to manage this on the fly as well, but anything I can get done beforehand will make things move more smoothly. And we can certainly go beyond nine o'clock, um, but I know that their time is more limited, but we'll see if they'll be able to stay on longer than nine. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Colleen? Yes. You know, we're not, we're not open yet. We've been, of course, a non-essential business. Right. So if there are other businesses out there that are open and have been more impacted in a way that they can describe to these guys, feel free to cut me out. Okay. Um, because I'm going to rant a little bit on them. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think it's important to know, too, though, that they don't have anything to do with this right now and, and haven't. You know, this is all the governor's doing. They're out of session right now. And they want to go back into session so that they can pass some laws, but they can they will do that in January or when the governor calls them back into session. And the governor has not called them back into session. 
So, you know, it, and the governor's listening to his agency heads and his trusted circle. And, um, you know, they are three legislators of 147. And the, that body is not in session right now. So if they have a personal relationship with the governor and he has limited personal relationships with people in the legislature, and I don't know that, you know, uh, I know two of our three don't have a relationship with him. So, um, and you'll probably hear bits and pieces of that today. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we all look at it a little bit different. Um, uh -huh. You know, that, that whole group of 147, whatever it is. Yes. You know, they work for the people of the state. They can get together and uh, make things happen, even though they're yes. not in session. That's kind of their job for us. Yes. You know? Hey, I see Steve Derringer. Good morning. How is everybody? Tired. <laughs> Very well. So yeah, we had about 150 people register for this. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I am looking through the list here. It's nice that they put it in alphabetical order. Hopefully, um, Kevin and Mike will be on shortly. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, good. We have Christine Walsh Rogers from um, First Federal that is going to join us. I'm here. Great. And we have several of our business advisors that we work with regularly, like Lena and Debbie. And let's see, I see Pam Rushton on as well. Hi, Pam. And Graham Ralston is joining us. And Mark Hanna. And our NOLA lobbyist, Josh Weiss. Oh, and here's Mike Chapman. Okay. Got a lot of folks on. Good morning, Mark Hanna. Well, good morning there, Colleen. How are you? I'm well. Good morning, Mike Chapman. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. What happened to your camera? There it is. Okay, let's see. Good morning, Colleen. Good morning. Who said that? Was that Mark? Graham. Oh, Graham. Uh, hi, Graham. How you doing? All right. How are you doing? I am doing very well, thank you. Looks like a school, school superintendent over there, too. <laughs> yeah, I see Marty Brewer. <laughs> and it looks like uh, Ryan Mullane and Nathan West are joining us. Um, Brando Bloor. Good, Bruce Paul. Okay, so we have 60 thus far. So I am going to get started right at 8 a.m. I don't see Kevin on yet. Paul Schieffen. So, Dale Dunning, do we have Dale in yet? Don't think so.
So today we do have uh, three prime objectives and they are for business owners in uh, the area to share what they are experiencing right now. And uh, just also want to let you know that we did get 265 responses so far to our business survey for businesses. And I'm working on kind of parsing that out so that we can share how things are going for people in different industries. And then also uh, we'll have a discussion on some potential suggested solutions and then we'll give our legislators an opportunity to respond. So I hope that notes. Um, start off with a little bit of housekeeping. I ask that everyone mute their, right now go in and, and mute their system so that we don't have any background noises. We all love our puppies and our kids, but uh, we've got limited time. So I'm hoping that everybody will uh, be as considerate as possible and mute their mics right now. Um, there we go. I'm admitting, oh, another 17 more people. So admit all, there we go. Mark Abshire, good. Dale Dunning, Barry from the city of Squim, Randy Johnson, Karen Affeld, Johanna Barti. Okay, Erica Lindholm. Okay, I'm gonna just wait. Just another minute, Steve Methner. Okay. So Dale, Dale Dunning, I know I admitted you. Dale? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, can hear you now. I can hear you. So um, I haven't seen that Kevin Vandeway has been able to join us yet. I'm here. Oh, good. Hi, hi Kevin. <laughs> Terrific. So we do have all three of our le legislators on. I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. It's already 8.03, so I ask business owners, um, if you'd like to speak, let me know. If you, um, we are going to have the business owners speak initially, and then we'll talk about some solutions, and then we are going to allow our legislators to respond. Um, I ask that everybody keep their um, mics turned off, and we'll go through this very quickly. Each business owner will have less than two minutes to share their, um, what they're experiencing currently. So go ahead and take it away, Dale. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll start with when this really started was on uh, uh, March 16th. You know, we got the, we, the word that we would have to close down or do a minimal service. And I called my staff in. I had 25 employees at that point. And by the end of the day, I was down to four employees. And uh, to say this is, has been a hellish time is an understatement. Um, you know, it's as a business owner, you never want to say you're going to fail, and, and we're not. We're determined to get through this. But uh, my business has lost twenty thousand dollars a month. You know, we go into the black twenty or into the red twenty thousand dollars a month. And the first part of this uh, came out of my personal savings, and we did get a PPP loan. Uh, the problem with that that runs for two months in the middle of June. You know, the forgivable part of that will be done, and so. If Congress doesn't do something about it, um, I'm going to have to go into my retirement funding to keep the business going. And that's not something I look forward to and I think would be a horrible thing. Uh, we've also experienced some supply chain uh, disruptions. Um, I just found out on Monday our prices of beef are going to go, are doubling. So, I mean, 
ground beef's going from three something a pound to over six something a pound. Sirloin steak, uh, five something a pound to over $12 a pound. So that's hard to run a business like that. Uh, so we, we face a lot of challenges and uh, looking at the governor's proposals, there's no way it will be profitable in phase two or phase three. And I don't expect our business to start earning or be into the black until sometime in the fourth quarter. Um, so that, in a nutshell, uh, it's been hellish. I mean, a lot of stress. We'll be there at the end, but <laughs> this is not fun. Okay, thank you, Dale. And Dale Dunning owns Oasis in Squim. Yes. So I am going to jump to Michael McQuay. If you're ready, Michael. Okay. If Michael is not, um, some other people that asked to speak. Oops, I got. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Bruce, Paul. Are you ready to share anything, Bruce? Okay, how about Donna Blakesley? Sure, I'll speak. Okay. I just, um, you know, I'm Bruce Paul from Forks Outfitters in Forks, Washington, and probably my biggest concern is um, for the grocery industry and, the, and retail is that phase two is more restrictive on our employees and uh, than what we've already been through. And I'm getting some pushback, you know, from our employees on some of the different regulations in phase two. So I have a concern about that. And, and it's still hard to get employees right now to operate. So that's probably my biggest concern. So I'll let other people speak. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, in the um, chat, if you are interested in speaking and you're a business owner, please put your name in the chat and what business and city you're from, please. Okay, uh, next, Michael McQuay, are you ready? I know he's on. Okay, I have also um, uh, Stephen Fofanoff or... Um, Let's see, Dan Fuller, Donna Blakesley, Laura Decker. I'll speak. Okay, <clears throat> please do. Um, I'm Dan Fuller. I own Just Fix It. I'm a self-employed goldsmith. My wife also owns her own business, which is Peninsula Awards. We've been shut down basically like everybody else since the middle of March. Um, going into this, we had money set aside for hopefully maintenance, repair, replacement of equipment, inventory. That's all been gone. Um, looking forward, our business is probably going to lose 80% going forward um, because of what we do. The events aren't happening. Um, I'm a very high ticket item industry and that market's gone. So the, the economy is not going to come back for us anytime soon in a way that's gonna make us profitable. So like Dale, we may hopefully break even or turn a profit in quarter four, but I'm not even looking forward to that. Thank you. Okay, anyone else here that would like to speak that's a business owner? Jeff, well, I know you had some Do you want to come off mute, Jeff? Down at the bottom of your screen, it has a mute. Can you get that? Bottom left corner of your screen, scrolling with your mouse. Okay, uh, let's see. I see Brian Koo is on. Brian, were there any of your um, Jefferson County businesses that wanted to speak? Hey, Colleen, good morning. I don't think I have any Jefferson County businesses on the line. If uh, okay. somebody, uh, they can speak up, but happy to answer any questions about Jefferson County. Okay. 
All right. Um, let's see. I had a long list of folks, and I I know Michael McQuay is on the line here. Oh, here he's he's trying to get in. Let me admit him. So Michael McQuay. Let's see if he. And I see Art Green's on. Art, do you want to share anything about 24-hour fitness or AM systems? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And I appreciate everybody getting on the call. And uh, yeah, it is very trying times. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my wife's business in town. We've owned almost five years. Anytime fitness. It's a 7,000 square foot gym. I have about 1,000 members. Um, obviously, health and wellness is important, especially in a time like this. Mental illness is is valuable um, and so my challenges are kind of understanding the phases and the reality of phase four because I'm a lot like these other guys I think a profit might show in phase four we have zero revenue right now um, the PPP money will uh, get, uh, run out mid-June so <clears throat> really just if we could have more of an understanding so we can run our business and understand what the loss ratio will be and, and what's the runway of cash and those kind of things trying to keep our employees employed is very valuable uh, to myself. And I had another question about, um, is there any relief statewide or federal for landlords that they can pass down to tenants? Um, or has any action been happening there? Uh, my landlord says no, he doesn't get any relief. Um, so he wants full rent. Any business like a restaurant, a gym, anything that needs volume of uh, members or customers, going 50%, it, you just will never have a profit. So. Is there any relief coming from, I don't know, the banks to the, to the landlords that they then can give to the tenants um, so they can continue to fight this fight? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Art. I think we'll talk about some of your questions in the solutions um, discussion period. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to add to uh the discussion here colleen can you hear me now this is jeff yes Walsh. yeah sure can okay. Jeff. okay my ipad wasn't playing nice but i brought up another screen so i got it working anyway um as a business owner with wright brothers aviation i've got all the same issues that all the other business owners are mentioning and we're, we're each unique and with our customer base and things but i have a particular specific question for our um, representatives in that, in this regards, the state itself and its Department of uh, Enterprise Services. Um, I've had a contract with the state as a vendor for over 22 years. And um, right when this pandemic was kicking off, they sent an email out to the vendors to initiate a new contract. Um, I did not receive that email. And and with further uh, investigation, a couple weeks later, they sent another email out with an amendment to the contract. I never got that. I didn't know that anything happened until one of my agency um, users called me up and said, you're not on the vendor list and we need you to do some wildlife tracking. I said, well, that doesn't make sense. I'm on the schedule to do all this flying coming up with the clam and the shrimp fisheries and things that are, that are opening up and some other surveys. And so I pull out our contract and see that the contract that I, extension I signed over three years ago had expired the 30th of April. So I called up DES and said, well, what's going on here? Um, the contract expired, I haven't heard from you. He said, well, we, we sent you an email, you didn't respond, the con solic solicitation went out, it's closed now, and you're out of luck. And in my mind, that, that's not an acceptable answer and that it seems like if they're charged with managing the contract and I pay them one of one and a half percent of my billing that I do for the state for them to manage the contract, sending me an email that I don't respond to isn't managing the contract, especially if they're charged with um, getting qualified, known, experienced vendors for agencies and, and things like that. I mean, I can go on and on about it, but the bottom line is, is I never even had a chance. And while all this this solicitation is going on, we're being shut down and I'm scrambling like crazy to um, adapt to the environment. And uh, it just seems like there are, there, there are some 
solutions that would solve this problem for me because I'm not flying anybody anywhere because everything's transportation is shut down other than essential workers and essential businesses. And uh, um, if I don't do this, I'll be like everybody else this winter when it rolls down out and we don't make money, I'll just be <laughs> underwater. But it just seems like there's there's a possible solution, but I haven't been able to, I don't know the bureaucracy and how it works and the contracting and so I'm just looking for some help. I have some ideas, but uh, it's, um, I just need some help to get this so I can at least do a little bit of flying and, and uh, keep going until this uh, pandemic is uh, relieved. Thanks for the time. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. And that's Jeff Well from Wright Brothers Aviation. He's operator of the Charter Air Service for our county. Um, I saw Paul Boucher had his hand up. So Paul, if you'd like to speak. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thanks, Connie. Thank, thank you for putting together the time, uh, everybody. Um, just real briefly here. You know, we've got kind of a, a unique business. Um, there's multiple components to it, the, the largest of which is uh, in the wedding business. 90% um, of our orders for the remainder of the year with weddings have been canceled, and that represents two-thirds of the profits of our company. Uh, those that have not canceled have been reduced by an average of about 80% on their order. Uh, as you imagine, you know, nobody really wants to plan anything more than immediate family members to celebrate a, a little uh, small nuptial. Um, by the way, this affects a, a, a very uh, large and growing industry on the peninsula. And anybody that wants to check out how many uh, vendors this, this potentially affects, the City of Swim has a website all about the wedding industry and destination weddings. And then it only represents about 60 to 75% of the uh, of the local vendors. Um, I, I will say that we have been very creative in, in adjusting. Um, anybody that's been through uh, Snowmageddon, closed for three weeks and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, you, you have to be able to adjust on the fly. We've done so successfully to be in the black. However, that's just temporary. It's with a reduction in, in hours for our employees. Uh, we have been able to bring somebody back in off of unemployment. Um, but you know, we're not going to be hiring, um, as, as part of our responsibility as business owners is, is, is to hire good people and give them good solid jobs. We're not going to be able to do that. And at the same time, um, it's going to cost us an enormous amount in labor just to try to keep the place clean. Um, yeah, we're, we're done with, with table service, uh, for walk-in business for, for and basically until there's a vaccination. I, I don't want to pay somebody um, to spend all of their time cleaning. And, and that's what it's going to take. So, uh, you know, we're, 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 you know, we haven't got the 25 employees that Dale has. You know, we're not a restaurant. We're, we're mostly in a takeout and delivery business. However, when those customers want to come in and sit down and enjoy something, it just costs us way too much money. So basically, our, our most of our wedding business for the remainder of the year, even though we're year round, uh, most of it's canceled. Uh, it's done. You know, we're not going to see that revenue uh, going into into winter. It's a scary proposition. You know, we had another snowstorm this year that that, that killed business for a while. Uh, you know what? That stuff's going to happen. But you know what? We we run with it. This kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know. You know, we're also looking at a minimum wage increase again in January. Um, I don't know how we're going to address that. It already went up another buck and a half this year. You know, we, we see every, everybody else's, you know, even the government, they're, they're canceling jobs in the state. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to address that for sure. You know, the rest of our business, you know, with the uh, curbside and, and takeout uh, type, of, type of business, we're down about 50%. So we're... we're we're running, barely paying the bills, um, and, and that's about it. Not unlike a whole lot of other people. You know, it, it's seasonal. Um, you know, we do the best we can. You know, we tell our employees mediocrity is failing. You know, what I'd like to see is, is better than mediocre solutions for the businesses that are on the line here. 
I, I know most of them are, are, are very successful and have been for many, many years. Um, we were, we're, we're looking for solutions that are not just going to put a Band-Aid on something for a few weeks or something like that. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. So Paul owns Take the Cake in on Washington Street in Squim. So Donna Blakesley, I know you wanted to say a few remarks. Yes, I'm just, we're, I'm in Forks as well, and we have Blakesley's Bar and Grill. Um, my concern, I'm sure, like, just like everyone else is in the restaurant industry is, are we going to continue to operate at a loss if you can have 50% capacity, but we're going to have to hire back 75 to 100% of your employees just to keep up with all the cleaning. Um, it's, I don't know, it's just crazy. We're all, you know, running right at this point. I mean, we're doing takeout, which we're pretty much operating as well at a loss um, on a daily basis. Um, and our community thrives in the summer these months on tourism. Um, nobody's here. Nobody's, I don't know. We don't, we don't have the business. And to keep operating at a loss, I, I don't know what we're going to do either. We've used our reserves as, as well, um, like everyone else. Um, the cleaning process, I mean, even the stipulations to operate, somebody's going to have to clean the bathroom after every use. I mean, that's probably a full-time employee, even at just 50% capacity. So, I don't know. That, I guess I'm in the same boat as everybody else, and I don't know how to fix it. Okay, thank you, Donna. Appreciate your input. Uh, William Armacost? Uh, with Changes Salon and the Mayor of Squim. William? I know I saw you were on. Here we go. William? We had well, your first up there. We can't hear you, William. We'll, we'll get back to you, William. Uh, and I see Colleen Robinson from Habitat for Humanity. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, Habitat was fortunate that um, while I had to close down both Habitat stores, we were deemed essential by the governor's office and were able to continue to build um, because we were low income housing, build the one house that we had underway in Port Angeles. However, what's happening now um, as a trickle down effect is the supply chain. So doors that we ordered, uh, interior doors with casings that we ordered um, over two months ago, um, the supplier couldn't get the materials to build the doors. Um, we can't get an occupancy permit until we have interior doors. Uh, so there's a trickle down effect that's happening um, with the supply chain that is affecting construction and low income housing. Also, um, due to uh, COVID, we're struggling to get permitting through um, in the city. We've paid for permitting, but we're waiting um, for those permits to come through. We've selected two new families. Uh, we do a summer build class that was very successful last summer, workforce training. Uh, we had eight students and partnered with the college. The college uh, has canceled all summer in-person classes, so Habitat is going to host that class ourselves mm -hmm. along with support from community partners um, to try and continue that workforce training in the trades that's desperately needed. Um, but there's definitely, um, as time goes on, a trickle down effect to COVID and not sure what the answer is, but to have a, one of our family partners not be able to get into our house because we can't get interior doors um, is definitely frustrating for her, who's been working on her house for a year and frustrating for Habitat. And I can only wonder as time goes on and these phases take forever, how much more impact that's gonna have as we move forward with our two new family partners. Okay, thank you, Colleen. So next is gonna be Michael McQuay and then Karen. Michael McQuay? Oh, can't hear you. We're texting, and I know he's on. How about now? Yay, there he 
there we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for uh, EDC once again for sponsoring um, this little uh, conference call. Um, I, 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 Dale and I spoke a couple days ago at length about some of the issues and you know some possible solutions that can come from the state in the form of uh, and maybe even the city of Port Angeles. I just got my tax bill uh, yesterday and um, for the first or second half, I can't remember. And uh, <laughs> I just wanted to bury it, you know. Uh, and uh, I feel for all the other restaurants and retail stores that are on this call. Um, we are indeed in the same boat um, and it's gonna be a challenge uh, over the next couple of weeks if Clallam County can get to uh, phase two and, and reopen. We're uh, definitely coming up with plans to do it. I like to say that my glass is uh, half full and if you knock it over, I take it back up. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm really concerned of, about that the gentleman just spoke of uh, from Take the Cake is uh, the minimum wage increases. And Mr. Chapman, I'm, I, um, you know, you know, you and I have spoke about this in the past many years ago when, uh, when uh, <clears throat> the wage increases started moving its way through the legislature. But I think it's pretty critical now that that the state, um, you know, maybe there's a threshold for small businesses. Uh, that that some of those things get frozen. Um, there's you know there's some tax credits I think that the state can do to help us get through this year. I don't see any uh, profitability at all this year. Um, it's going to be a big dark hole. Um, um, I'm hoping to get to break even by the end of July and, and kind of just float through the rest of the year and looking forward to next spring. Um, that's kind of my game plan. Hunker down and and uh, preserve cash. Um, but uh, I, I would sure like to see some, some plans coming out of the state to help us small business mitigate. And I, I think one thing that could absolutely be of huge help as we try to get through um, the next year is what we're talking about, not three months or six months. I mean, it's going to be till next May before the I believe before anybody starts uh, tourism wise and tourism is 75% of my business as well. Um, and it happens between May and, and uh, first couple weeks of October. Uh, so I, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear from our legislatures and, and hear what plans there are to, to help us small businesses um, stay in business because we're, you know, especially restaurants, um, you know, we, we generate a mass amount of tax revenue. Just my, you know, my, my company with, uh, you know, our 70 employees we have by, you know, the late June um, in my catering business, uh, you know, we pay a tremendous amount into l &I and we never have l &I claims. Uh, we pay a tremendous amount into employment security. We almost never have any em employment security claims. Um, and we create a massive tax revenue base along with, uh, with the hotels, um, both for our city, our county and, and the state. Um, and I just have a really bad feeling that a lot of us are gonna be uh, not here this time next year um, if we don't get some additional relief. Uh, and of course the state can't do everything and the state's got its own issues, the city and the, and the county as well with tax revenue. Um, but if, if we don't survive, it's going to get much, much worse for, uh, for our whole community. Um, that's really all I got to say, Colleen. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Michael McQuay. And Michael owns Cocapelli Grill and Coyote Barbecue in uh, Port Angeles. He's also on the EDC board, and we really appreciate his volunteerism and leadership. Uh, so um, I see that... Uh, uh, Laura, Laura Decker, um, you're, she's not able to speak, I guess, uh, but Lissy, do you want to do you want to talk, Lissy? Sure. Laura is concerned with getting employees back that are making more now on unemployment and what will be their motivation to come back to work. And Lissy, can you share what 
uh, what business Laura Decker owns, and of course it's in Forks, right? Yes, Laura Decker owns Pacific Inn Motel in Forks. Okay, thank you. And so Jane Abbott, George Washington Inn and Washington Lavender Farm. Yes, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Colleen. Sure. Um, obviously in the hospitality business as Michael and so many others have already indicated, there, there's a lot going on. Um, here at the Inn, we have not only did new reservations screech to a halt in March, but we are also almost daily refunding existing reservations. Uh, nothing on the books until at least sometime later in June. And so we've lost over $60,000 so far this year. And then of course, this is the start of lavender season. Um, lavender is outdoors. There's plenty of room for social distancing and all of that. But um, it's, it's hard to say what's coming. And with the current restrictions on gatherings, um, it doesn't seem to be clear whether that's outdoor or indoor. Um, some clarification on that would be helpful. And then of course, the, the lavender shops are generally fairly small. So there's not a lot of room for people to get inside. Um, so we're gonna have to get creative with some way to do online pickup orders or something like that. And of course, this is the start of lavender season and it's a relatively short season. And if things don't improve significantly and some of the gathering regulations be lifted, uh, lavender may be out the door for this year and with basically zero revenue. So I think one thing I'd like to request is that there be some consideration for outdoor events where there's still plenty of room for um, social distancing and probably very minimal impact because of the fresh air um, so that, that would be one thing I would request. Thanks. Okay, certainly. Um, Donna Harrison of um, Harrison Shoes. John and Donna Harrison. Okay. I know they, um, are, they own the shoe store that's been in business, I think I read 70 years. Um, in the Squim uh, near J.C. Penney's, and I I read uh, something from her the real frustration that for uh, Costco and Walmart they're able to have people walk in and buy shoes there, but her locally owned store that where she could easily ad address social distancing and the like she is shut down and doesn't have nearly the advantages that, and um, capital capacity that obviously Costco and Walmart do. And yet it's the same product, and, uh, but it puts small business owners at a much uh, greater risk, of course, of going out of business, and it's just not fair. So um, that was one, I hope I captured that all right for her. And I see that uh, Karen Hain Hainlin, if I said that right, wants to speak. Karen? Okay, uh, I'm not hearing you, so how about James Castell? Yeah, thanks. Um, I've talked to several different business owners, uh, James from Castell Insurance, from those of you who don't know me. Um, and a lot of the concern is about equity with regards to the PPP. Um, it seemed really great when people got the money, like, yes, I finally got this lifeblood to my business. However, due to state regulations, I can't open my business. And a majority of those funds are required to be used for payroll. And so it puts people kind of in this cash 22. You've got the money to reignite your business, but the state legislation says you can't. So now this money that was supposed to infuse me the lifeblood is going to end up just being a repayable loan over time because it has to be used within, I believe, a 10-week period um, or something around there on 75% payroll. Now, I know some restaurants have been able to do that, but when you look at other states that have lifted these stay-at-home mandates earlier, obviously the PPP was a federal fund, and it seems like now states like Texas and Nashville and Ohio and all these places that get to open 
all of those businesses are going to have a, a better shake at using that money for what it's for and then being forgiven versus those of us that are still on lockdown. You can't bring everyone back. I talked to John and Donna yesterday about it from Harrison's and, you know, they got the PPP, which is great. But if you can't bring people into work, it just converts into a loan, which isn't that helpful for folks um, forecasting for the future. So I just wanted to see, I don't know what sway the state legislators have, or if we can start pounding that door that some states are put at a competitive disadvantage for that PPP repayment. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I think I've caught everyone. Um, Peggy, you said you received a notice from Karen, her speakers aren't working. Is there something, or Mike isn't working, can you read? her comment, do you have it there available? Yes. Uh, yeah, she wanted to know um, why we're following what the governor is saying. Um, she had said that she was trying to file for an EPIN for filing taxes and she was having some problems with it. Um, it was more of a comment than a question. Um, she just wanted to keep King County out of here and uh, segregate us from the King County stats. Okay. Thank you. So uh, did anyone else have anything? If you do, go ahead and speak. And if not, we'll move into the next section. Colleen, this is William Armacost. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Thanks, William. Yeah, the hair industry, um, we're taking it in the shorts. Many of our smaller salons and nail salons are one man, one woman shows. The opportunity of controlling the sanitation, the proper hygiene, the clean environment, is something that we obviously ongoing practice. With this shutdown, not only are we losing our personal business, but we have many of us additional rental tenants that I cannot personally justify charging them rent when they're locked down in the same boat I am. I operate as a one person, very exclusive, one client at a time. Currently, I'm down $26,000 as just a simple hairdresser. I've spoken to two different hairdressers that have chosen to go out of business because they've had to try to get part-time jobs in places like Walmart, Costco, Home Depot that are open, crowded with people, some of them wearing masks, some of them not wearing masks. We have a significant bias on who is essential and who isn't. The sad reality with these younger operators and nail techs, they've got to feed their children. They're now getting in line at food bank to get food to put on the table and they're trying to figure out how they can pay rent. We will never recoup the loss of income, all of the businesses on this call as a result of this pandemic. We need to have some help and we need to have it expedited as soon as possible because the fatality rate is happening. One of my independent contractors that rents her own salon, she chose to retire because she's been contemplating within the next year. Well, this pushed her over the edge. So legislatures, Please listen to your constituents. We need help and we need it now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, William. Nicely said. Uh, Susan Baratel with Dungeness Kids. Hi, how are you? Hi, Susan. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> I think um, I'm all about flattening the curve and I, I, I'm grateful that our government has done what they've done to, to um, do that. But I think what's most frustrating is how arbitrary everything is. Um, like several other people have said, it seems um, hard to comprehend that it's okay to go like hundreds of people to be in Walmart or Costco at a time or lining up outside of it when our little small businesses can handle one person at a time. Like, why can't we do appointments? Um, you know, curbside is now open, but why wasn't that okay before when for retail when it was okay for um, restaurants? And it just seems somewhat arbitrary. It'd be nice for the government to come up with some sort of plan like you know what we can do to um, open our business and open it safely probably more safely than some of those big box stores and um, save our business and it would just be nice to have some sort of guidance and also i think um, they need to put to recognize that all of us business owners don't want that in our store like if i got the coronavirus i'd have to shut down for two weeks I don't want that to happen, so I'm going to do what I need to do to make sure that I um, make people safe in my store and make myself safe and my employees safe. And it would just be nice to see some sort of, um, you know, guidelines for that and recognize that we all are doing our best to 
to uh, mitigate the situation. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Uh, anyone else? So Dale, you had talked about, um, I'm gonna move on then. Uh, of time, we have 20 minutes left. Uh, so Dale, you had talked about um, a potential suggestion you had. Do you wanna share that? Yeah, I've got two suggestions for the legislature. I mean, because we, we really need help from the legislature. My, my first one, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. It, my first thing is I think they should do a tax credit on our excise and B&O taxes. I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting a $20,000 tax credit. You could take that credit over whatever time period that it takes, you know, to fulfill it, if it's a month or five months or whatever. Uh, it would be applied against your excise and B&O taxes. And that would be a real financial help because <laughs> the state still wants their taxes during all this time, even though we're losing money. And my second suggestion, and this, I want you legislatures, you guys to listen to this really carefully, is stop doing stuff to us. Um, over the last three, four years, uh, you've we raised the minimum wage on us. Uh, paid leave, sick leave. There's all kinds of mandates with scheduling and things uh, that's really making it difficult to be in business. And what you've done is you've priced a lot of marginal workers out there. You've priced them out of the market because we're in a whole different market now. And I was short of uh, labor last year and desperate. Things have changed and it's more my advantage now I can hire, hire quality employees because there's more people going to be looking for jobs. So the legislature needs to back off and, you know, with some of these things that they've required. So those are my two suggestions. Okay, thank you, Dale. I saw, I got a text here that Mary um, Niskern and Debbie Fusen and Jared Dickinson would like to speak. And then after those, so please keep it to two minutes. And after that, in the, that order, uh, Mary, Debbie, then Jared will, I'm um, gonna ask the legislators to take a turn. So um, thank, Mary? Yeah, thank you, Colleen. Um, I run a, a pet grooming salon in Squim, um, and I have two employees, one part-time and one full-time, um, who are both obviously laid off because pet grooming has been de deemed non-essential. Um, I have no problem with doing my part to save a life. I service a majority of a vulnerable population. So me shutting my business down voluntarily two weeks or a few days prior to the order was not an issue for me. The issue is two months later, I've received no funds until Monday of last week. And that was from unemployment. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and put my business out there because this isn't just about me. It's about other people. Um, the fact that the SBA denied felons any loan money is absolutely ridiculous because what is it that the SBA thinks that felons do when they can't feed their families? Um, I contribute a lot to the local economy and I do a lot of pro bono work. My past and my history should not have prevented me from being eligible for those federally backed loans. That said, I also think that it's crap that corporate groomers have been able to operate this entire time um, and not having any care to their employees or the pets that they groom because their groomers are highly untrained and, um, and do a poor job. And so those are my two biggest issues. Um, again, I'm all like Susan for flattening the curve, but at this point, you know, um, I also just wanna tell all of you um, restaurant owners, I will be spending money curbside or not at your restaurants, I feel like. As a community, we should come together and spend our money in small business. Um, and that is how we will rebuild, however that happens. That's all I have. Thank you, Mary. Okay, and now, um, Debbie. Thank you, Colleen. Um, um, I represent several different businesses and several different, um, or I work with them um, as an advisor. And they are very confused about some, some of the moving forward. Um, they're having to say, as many of the restaurateurs have said, 50% uh, capacity. They don't have the table space in order to accommodate that and stay in business. You can't be profitable with five tables in a, in a business that you had 13, like uh, First Street Haven with Mike. Um, I don't know how he's going to do it. Uh, we have seen um, 
two restaurants so far that have decided to shutter their doors here in Port Angeles. And even though we are going and we are purchasing meals as takeout you know, at trailers and at Coca Pelli's and everybody has made these adjustments, I don't think the governor is looking at the long-term effects of his continuing to go down this path of slow opening our state. I'm all for protecting our vulnerable population. I'm part of it for Pete's sake. I have asthma. I'm 67 years old. We have to look at protecting, but yet opening up our economy. So number one, the state doesn't go bankrupt because if we're not operating, we're not collecting sales tax. We're not generating B and O tax. We, our rainy day fund is going to go away. So our legislators really have to figure out a way to get us back open and back open safely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now last is Jared. Jared, I'm not hearing you. Can you uh, hear me? Oh, yes, now we can. Thanks, Jared. Okay, thank, thank you. Hey, first of all, I'd like to say I really appreciate the, uh, the representatives that are on here that have uh, responded to me, uh, to my emails or to my messages uh, via their Facebook. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not so, so sure there is a solution for our, our, our conundrum we're in uh, because of the limitations. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably uh, the minority on this, on this conference here that, you know, the state just needs to open it up and we all just need to get back to work. That's really the only solution. Uh, the people who are willing to uh, shut down and want to stay shut down, maybe they receive a tax credit or, or some, some form to uh, assist them in their voluntary uh, shutdown. But there's really not a solution except getting back to work. Um, I also would really like to see our local representatives uh, be more involved in creating these rules. Um, I'd like to see uh, the, the, emer the emergency has been uh, run so far by the governor and I really would like to see our local representatives uh, take control um, and be in front of the microphone and, and be creating the rules. I don't know why one person is being able to uh, dictate these or his his commission to be able to dictate this. I'd like to see our representatives be voting uh, around the state on what should and shouldn't be happening. Um, so that's Kevin and uh, Mr. Chapman and everybody here on here. I, I really see that you guys really need to be having more of a, a hands-on uh, and be in front of the microphone and be speaking instead of uh, Inslee, to be perfectly honest. Um, but we all need to get back to work. I haven't been held back too much. Okay. Thank, thankfully. Thank you, Jared. And what business are you with, Jared? I'm a realtor, professional okay. realty services. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, now our legislators, um, Kevin, Steve, and Mike, would you like to comment? I think that was a good transition. Anyone? I, I can go first, I guess. Uh, this is Kevin Vandewag, and uh, Steve and Mike can follow me up. Um, first, thanks for putting together this phone call. It's been incredibly helpful and, and good to hear uh, from business owners. We've been hearing a lot from business owners and have been working with them. Um, and we share a lot of your frustrations, particularly around, I know some people were talking about how some businesses were considered essential other ones weren't, um, and we share your frustrations there. I think moving forward, um, the legislature will work to put some parameters around uh, what's considered essential business in the, um, in the event this happens again or there's a second wave, uh, which it would be unfortunate, but um, is a strong possibility, certainly. Um, and then to answer, um, so, uh, building on that a, a little bit, um, we are not in session, and the governor has not chosen to call us in a special session. I don't think he probably will anytime soon. Um, there is a method that the legislature can call ourselves into special session. 
I don't think legislative leaders are really excited about that. And, but um, some of us are pursuing how, how to go about that happening. Um, in answering some questions, um, the Forks Outfitters gentleman mentioned something about PPE, and I, I, I don't know if he was talking about his employees with personal protective equipment, um, but I didn't fully uh, understand that and would love to hear more about that. Wright Brothers Aviation, the gentleman from Wright Brothers Aviation, his issue is exactly the type of thing legislators can um, help business owners with. Um, so I'd encourage him to write any one of us and we can uh, help in his um, contract with um, the, those uh, state agencies. Um, I don't want to take up all the time, so I'll let Mike and Steve talk and then be happy to come back and talk more. Thank you, Kevin. Mike, Representative Chapman. That was Mike. That was Kevin speaking. That was Senator Van de Weg. And I, Mike Chapman was on. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Thanks, Mike. So these are difficult times. Certainly appreciate all the comments. Uh, like Kevin said, we have been, our email has been inundated with comments. Um, we did send a letter to the governor with trying to clarify some of the essential businesses that should be open. I agree that small business, and I have been an early advocate that small business should have been open all along, that they had a better, uh, better chance of uh, pr practicing social uh, distancing. But the governor has broad authority. And... Uh, and that's just the way it is in the state of Washington. So it, th these are his calls. He has not replied to many of, uh, many of my uh, inquiries of him, and nor has he asked for much advice from the legislature. So he has operated under his own uh, guidelines that he has determined. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and make a, a defense. I certainly hear the criticism. I appreciate that. I would like to clarify just a couple of things. Minimum wage is very difficult for small business, but it was a voter approved initiative and it takes uh, some real work and heavy lifting to overturn a voter approved initiative. Some of us have worked on the, around the edges to try to make it a little more palatable and we may try to continue to do that. Um, there's a move afoot to suspend all pay increases for state employees and I'm, been supportive of that but I appreciate that people in small business have a very difficult time of meeting the minimum wage um, unemployment the federal $600 per week extra I don't think you you'll ever make more money on the state unemployment system than you make at your job but the federal $600 boost is certainly making it possibly right now where people are making more money on unemployment but that those dollars expire July 1st and it does not appear the federal government is going to be able to extend that. Um, in fact, the president said yesterday he wouldn't. So I think we have one more month of that extra benefit that hasn't, but the state system is uh, clearly, you're never going to make more on the state unemployment. We did pass uh, the rule. We, we got the governor to agree that um, small businesses who take in unemployment or PPE will not be paying B&O tax on that. And the B&O tax filing has been extended. I serve on the finance committee and we're looking at further um, delays of B&O tax. There's a move afoot and the small business community and the large business community is starting to coalesce around the idea of more of a um, corporate or a business income tax based on profit because of times like this where businesses may bring in revenue but they literally are making no profit. And over the next two to three years, I think you're gonna see the business community around the state saying, you know what, we'll pay our taxes, but we want it to be on profit, not on revenue. Um, uh, one other thing is mandatory scheduling. I, there was a comment about how we're making people, that didn't pass and I'll take some credit. I'm the vice chair of labor and I, I worked pretty hard to try to kill that bill. So mandatory scheduling is not the law of the state. It is the law in the city of Seattle. Uh, there, are, there are those who want to bring it to the state, but right now um, that didn't pass. And then paid leave, I understand people are frustrated with that. 
So there was an initiative that was going to go forward that was much more progressive in benefits. And the business community did some polling around the state and it was going to pass with uh, well over 60%. So then the business community came to the legislature over a two session period and really negotiated uh, a much reduced benefit. There are those on, there are those that I know of that are very frustrated that the legislature didn't just let the initiative go forward, but at the end of the day, an agreement was negotiated with the business community on the paid family medical leave. I, I appreciate that people don't like that who run business, but you would not have liked the initiative. It was much like the minimum wage initiative that went forward, but didn't include a starter wage and has much more aggressive increases. And the business community had started to negotiate with the legislature on minimum wage, but then they walked away and then the initiative passes. So in this state, those kinds of initiatives are going to pass. So we try to do the best thing. We took a lot of input on the paid family leave. I get it. I get, I've not heard from one small business owner who likes it, but I don't think, I guess we could have said no and taken and let the initiative go forward. But to me, that would not have been, uh, we would have ended up, well, people can disagree. I think it was the right thing to do to vote for an, a negotiated agreement, but there will be plenty who disagree with that. And I appreciate that. And I take all that criticism to heart. I get it. Right now, I don't think that people think that um, we're doing a good job for small business, and uh, I'll accept that criticism, and I appreciate the input. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, one thing I want to clarify, I did just check, um, the $600 per week lasts through July, so it goes until um, July 31st they people can make the last claim on july 25th so it's actually two more months of this going on um but i really appreciate mike's comments he's a passionate advocate in olympia for small businesses and our community um representative theringer uh thanks colleen uh thanks everybody for coming together and i guess dale your letter to us sort of catalyzed this so thanks for that we you and i have had sort of an ongoing conversation about some of the issues just in general um kind of the way the hierarchy works here for the different phases and the health decisions. I mean, the governor is really listening to his Department of Health, to John Wiesman and to Kathy Lawfee and driving that with a lot of, you know, medical information, public health information. But that's also being driven down. A lot, of, a lot of the decisions are made at the local level with our local um, health officer, Tom Locke in Jefferson County and, and uh, Dr. Unthink in, in Clallam, and then they work with their boards of health and with the commissioners to approve these plans. <clears throat> and I think if we work through that process, like uh, what phase two is, uh, uh, Bruce, you brought up uh, uh, the issue around uh, phase two and how that's more impactful on your employees. Uh, I mean, those kind of specifics, I think, are good to get to the local health officer and the local board of health so that we can move that up the chain. I think that's going to be more effective than us going to the governor and trying to loosen that. And then as that dialogue develops, we can then pressure the governor and pressure at the state level. But I think those decisions and that flexibility is can be driven on the local level. So I would engage with you know your county's health office, your county board of health, and your county commissioners on some of those issues and help refine them because as we know uh we're because uh, we're we have fewer cases out here in the peninsula and we have fewer um you know less impact we're very concerned and a lot of businesses i've talked to are concerned about i5 folks coming in and impacting us but developing some local protocols and then getting agreement around those and then driving those up to the state level i think are helpful I mean, the letter Mike and Kevin and I sent to the governor to get Clallam into the phase two, uh, you know, queue was based on some of that local data. So that's just kind of a general way, I think, to approach this. 
as is I think the state's driving stuff down to the EDCs and the ADOs around a lot of this economic work. And Colleen, thank you for that. And, and Brian, thank you for that. Because that's kind of how this dialogue needs to work. We're not going to have a lot of effect as legislators, uh, you know, basically throwing rocks at the governor's window. That's just, we need, we need, we need this data to come percolating up from the, from the bottom up. Um, I think the tax issue, as Mike mentioned, there's a lot of momentum, I think, and people I'm talking to about dealing with that. Probably won't happen until January. If we go into a special session, the special session will just deal with some of the state's budget issues. Dale, you brought that up. Um, as you know, when we left town, we put 200 million of the stabilization account into COVID relief. The governor vetoed, I think it was about 450 million out of, or I think it was around 120 million out of our, our supplemental budget and the operating budget in anticipation to cuts in revenue. And I think you're gonna see, if we do have a special session, more um, you know, adjustments like that, because we have about a $4.5 billion hit to what is the second year of the biennium, which is about a $25 billion budget. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty big hit for us. Um, and you would maybe see some decisions around there Major policy changes won't happen, I don't think, till we go into session in January. Um, I think that, as you know, as business owners, opening up is one thing, having customers come in is another thing. And that conscientious sort of community approach to you know, hand washing and all the and social distancing and, and cleaning services and all that, that sort of, you know, sort of culture of, of um, dealing with the virus and dealing with this is really what I think is going to help us open up our doors and get our economy going again. Um, I am disappointed and I feel a lot of the comments have been really, um, I think, helpful around the arbitrary nature, right, around what gets open and what's allowed as essential business and what's not. That's great information for us. I think we should, again, work through the bottom up and we'll obviously take it to the top but on those, you know, getting clarity and some common sense into that, I think would be, would be super, super helpful. Um, I'm just, you know, the peninsula and uh, our district is very resilient. Um, these have been really thoughtful comments and we certainly want to take that information and, and keep the dialogue going and move that up into our world, you know, at the Department of Health and at the governor's office. Um, but that's sort of my, my take on this. Uh, Jeff, I looked into, as you know, we looked into staff. I had staff talk to DES about your contract. And we talked to the legislative person, our legislative liaison from DES. And um, there, there was no movement. They said, the, the, and I think Leanne, you know, exchanged, an e my, my aide exchanged an email with you and they're just not budging on that one. They said, you missed the deadline and you've got to wait for the next time. And they tried to contact you. What I heard today from you was that you did not get those emails, which what they were telling us is they sent them, you just didn't respond to them. So that may give us a window on that. If you can get in touch with Leanne about that, we'll try to clarify that. If, they, if you never received them, that's one thing. If you got them in your inbox and then respond, that's kind of their position. You missed your opportunity. So let's keep working on that. But if you've got more information around that, get in touch with Leanne and we'll try to pursue it a little further. Great. Thank you very much, Representative Theringer. Um, a couple different things. Uh, first off, I want to allow Roger Olson to speak. He owns, he uh, manages uh, FKC Screw, I'm sorry I missed you. Uh, and then Randy Johnson is one of our three commissioners. Commissioner Johnson is along the line, so I'd like him to speak. And then lastly, um, just so everyone knows, I think it's a value that Josh Weiss, our NOLA, which is the North Olympic Legislative Alliance, he is our lobbyist. He is on with us as well, uh, representing both Clallam and Jefferson counties. And we have uh, uniformly agreed that 
we need to shift our focus for our advocacy efforts around uh, economic development and business issues for this next session. But he also has worked for WASAC, the Washington, Washington State Association of Counties. Um, and he represents many counties to include Snohomish. And I think Clark, is that right, Josh? I'll let him speak in just a moment. But so I'd like Roger, then Randy, and then Josh to speak. Um, and potentially there can be some coordination between uh, Randy and our county commissioners and some work Josh might be doing for us in the future. So uh, Randy, er, I'm sorry, Roger? Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, FKUC, we're an equipment manufacturer. We manufacture equipment for like water or wastewater and pulp paper food. So we're an essential business. And I feel kind of bad because we're actually doing pretty good. But the trick for us is we have to put people on airplanes flying to other parts of the country to start up our equipment and then fly them back. So our people are at risk from sitting in airplanes. It's one thing when you can control your environment and wear your mask, but if you're sitting on planes, we kind of lose control is a little weird bringing people back in. What we don't want to do is bring any bugs back into the county. Um, so really for us, if we had access to better masks, you know, like the good N95 masks, I know they're being reserved for the, you know, first responders, and I understand that. But the more personal protective gear we can get in, and even maybe even the COVID-19 testing, I know right now, you know, personal or the first responders are, uh, are kind of first in line and you know, the, uh, you know, senior centers, fine. But rather than bringing somebody back that might have been exposed into our community and having them stay at home for two weeks, um, if I could bring them in, pay $100 for a test, then bring them back in the office quicker, it would just help the business. So it really just access to, uh, you know, more, more safety equipment and even just even commercial testing just to kind of clear people just so we, everybody's kind of happy to get on with things and we don't have to worry about uh, spreading the germs to the local community and family and friends and in our business because if we get it in here in the office, we have to have to shut down. So that's all I have to say. But uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Roger. So uh, Randy Johnson, if you would like to speak, please. I know the governor just changed his uh, criteria to open. Uh, different counties yesterday he announced that uh, I did put it out in a blast email to everybody but can you share with us what the county is looking at working with Dr. Unthink and the Board of Health and then three commissioners. Yeah, I'm, uh, can you hear me now? Um, yes. Yeah quickly just so everyone understands yesterday the governor announced as we everyone knows uh, yesterday uh, morning or whenever it was. Uh, we met as a Board of Health yesterday afternoon. Uh, we're going to meet again to vote, hopefully, to move to phase two uh, of next Wednesday, so that as fast as we can go. Uh, Dr. Arnthank had seven issues that she felt like we needed to meet. We meet six of those. We would already put in place the hiring of particularly someone to be a trace uh, people that have COVID-19 and all the people around them. We did have that person in, in, in the county staff at the current time, but we're in the process of hiring that person. So I believe, now I don't know, but I believe we'll meet all the criteria. So at that time, we'll be moving forward to the state for a request for the variance as, as a phase two, just so everyone knows. So we're going as, absolutely as fast as we can with our current legislative process. Again, understand the doctor has to recommend it. We have to have the information from the hospitals that says that we meet the criteria, including PPE, et cetera. Uh, the Board of Health has to approve it and the county commissioners, and we've tried to truncate as much as possible and put that all together to, to obviously meet the requirements we have to move phase two. Uh, the second thing that people should know very, just very quickly, I don't want to take too much time, but Obviously, we uh, started out with a program through our Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, keeping lights on for some of the nonprofits. Uh, we're doing that again uh, in the month of June. We've been working as a county with uh, uh, Craft3 to look at, at uh, loans, low cost loans for those businesses that are in need. Uh, certainly, is maybe only a part of the answer. I get that too. 
Uh, and finally, we are certainly looking at the whole issue under the third act of how we might be able to help, and certainly business has to be part of that. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Johnson. Um, and now, Josh Weiss, do you want to add anything? Or do you feel comfortable doing that? He is our NOLA, NOLA lobbyist. Josh, I think I saw him earlier. Maybe he needed to step off. Okay, well, we will continue to work on plans for reopening with the county. And I think um, the governor's kind of one size fits all strategy for the different counties um, is something of a challenge depending on the density. And so, but the uh, between Department of l &I, Department of Health, Department of Commerce and the governor's staff, they are working together on uh, more detailed plans and they have said it will be a reiterative, reiterative process for different industry sectors to be able to open up and they are looking for feedback uh, about their processes. Um, I see James Thompson also is with us today. He is the executive director of the Washington Public Ports Authority and I know for ports and also for tenants of ports. He has been involved in that process and communicating, but um, there are some ways to communicate with the governor about this reopening process. Um, uh, so feel the, the Clallam EDC is having our uh, board meeting on May 27th and uh, Mark Abshire, who's also on this call today, is has volunteered to be the head of our steering committee. And uh, because each of the chambers have been working on a business recovery plan and we are trying to coordinate that with uh, our different chambers. We have four chambers in Clallam County plus with Jefferson County EDC and the, the chambers in that county. And then also with our North Olympic Development Council, which is a federally funded organization. And we're all trying to coordinate and work together to ensure that information gets out and smart programs are created. Um, one of the things I wanted to share is that Facebook just yesterday announced that they're opening uh, retail stores on their site so that in, like businesses that have their Facebook page, but maybe that don't have their own retail um, online website, they are going to allow catalogs to be uploaded. And so that will allow people locally to shop at their local stores more readily. Um, and the North Olympic Development Council, which is run by Karen Affeld, and I see she's on, uh, they're receiving funding, $200,000 for the next two years. And uh, our board has been talking about hiring someone that would potentially help small businesses with digital marketing um, so that those local businesses can work to put their catalogs and their um, their retail opportunities or uh, restaurant menus online and help them to interact more readily with their customers during this period. Um, so let's see. Oh, I also wanted to mention that on our website, uh, Choose Clallam First, which is our response page to the coronavirus, um, that we have many, many business resources that we update that website every day. We just received a big thick um, notice of all sorts of different federal resources available and we're trying to get that up there in, in a way that's easily searchable. Um, so, uh, and also as an example right now, there's a loan available for businesses in rural counties 
Um, and it is at 2.44% up to 25,000. You can defer payments for six months um, and, and there's no fees associated with it. Um, they have a lot of funds available to loan. Now granted that's a loan and not a grant. Um, I, was, I was really surprised based on some of the responses of our most recent survey, how few businesses have in Clallam County have applied for PPP loans. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll get more people to apply for those loans. And we've got some real expertise in this county on how to structure your spending of that money so that it all ends up being a grant. Um, and if there's a portion that you're not um, using that would not be considered a grant, you can just uh, give that portion of the money back. But there, this is essentially a grant if you use it the right way. And we do have eight different business advisors that are available and have deep expertise to help you um, understand that. And it's an incredibly pro complicated process that the rules are changing constantly, which I know is a huge frustration. But if you put the money into a separate account, um, both First Federal and Sound Community Bank are still taking applications. Uh, we'd really like businesses in our county to basically receive that those free grant funds and, and import those dollars here to our community. Um, so uh, there's, again, different, I want, I want business owners and uh, folks here on this call to understand we are actively working to help our county and our region's ability to get through this. And we're doing it in partnership. And we've got a lot of really brilliant people helping us. Um, I saw uh, Graham Ralston's on this call. Uh, he's been an exceptional advocate and um, expert for everyone in this community. And, uh, and so additionally, one thing that we're working on is that this has been a big area that I've, been, I've recognized as a huge opportunity that we haven't pursued. And that is that the largest, so, you know, our county has a GDP. And the, the vast, a huge majority of that GDP comes from government contracts, whether it be from federal, state, or local government contracts. Um, you probably have seen on Highway 101 that Bagley and Seabird Creek are being, um, the state is putting in uh, culverts there. That's $30.8 million for that project. And yet it's not staying local. Uh, Scarcella Brothers from Seattle got the contract and Trenchless um, Construction LLC out of Arlington is doing all the dirt work. And yet the state sees that, oh, this is great. We're getting fun. You know, the economically distressed county of Clallam is getting $30.8 million of, you know, investment. Well, it, it's not staying local is the problem. So. We want to, one, have an expert that um, can educate our, not just construction businesses, but also um, cleaning professionals and service providers that can support uh, Customs Border Protection, Olympic National Park, um, the state agencies that are here in our communities, but also our school districts, our uh, ports, our, you know, roads, and broadband installation, et cetera. If we can get, keep some of that money here locally, that can be a real opportunity and boon for our economies. Um, in 2017, Representative Theringer helped me get $250,000 into the state budget and for a study that showed that just if the, if just the 10 top contracts, government contracts would stay locally on an annual basis, that would provide a $667 million economic impact to rural communities instead of those contracts going to rich, big, huge Seattle Tacoma companies. 
So I really believe that um, that's something that we should be working towards in a, in a broad way, working on bonding issues, joint ventures and the like to, um, to, to take advantage of that, the economy associated with governments that we just have not been getting any part of over the last decade. So um, with that, I really appreciate the time of our legislators. We're obviously 20 minutes over. If there's any last minute items that any of our commissioners or um, our uh, legislators would like to add, or any of our city council members, I see several on right now, um, please take this opportunity to say last few words and then we'll call it a morning. Anyone? Okay, going once, going twice. And uh, for all of our partners on the call, I see Mark and Lissy and Brian and Angie, thank you so much for joining us today. We do have, you know, as I've been taking notes here as people spoke, I, I do have resources and you'll probably, a lot of the business owners will probably get some emails from me um, that I wanted to clarify a few things and talk about opportunities. If you as a business owner have not applied for a PPP loan, please let me know. Um, and I wanna understand why you're not and what is, um, you know, it, and make sure that it's smart for you not to apply for that PPP money because it's still out there. And like I said, both Sound Community Bank and First Federal are still doing that. Even if it's ten, twelve thousand dollars, I mean that could get you through as an independent contractor. That could get you through for a couple months. And it's also, in our view, it's you know it's importing uh, the federal dollars to our economically distressed community. Um, I, uh, Ryan Mullane, I saw you were on. Is there anything you want to talk about? You're such an critical asset to our, um, you know, regional economy. And I know you've been working with lots of folks, but I just want to give you an opportunity to speak if you would like to. Well, I can just give everybody a quick update on the border. You probably have seen that the border closure extension um, was put out through June. Um, the reality is not has not changed from what I spoke of uh, last week, which is that uh, the provincial government and the Canadian federal government are taking a very long view again, um, and it's in their estimation still looking like uh, more likely that January would be a reopening time. So for anybody who's relying on that coho traffic, uh, I don't have good news, but as I get any further news, I'll certainly update everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Anyway. So, Colleen, this is Steve. Are you? Are these still weekly? Do you do these calls? Yes. What's your yes. Yeah. So it would be good, I think, to check back. At least we'd be interested in checking back, you know, in a couple weeks after the county starts opening up into phase two, uh, how things are going. I mean, obviously, you can contact our offices at any time, but this was good to hear, uh, you know, a number of people speak about how the process is working. So... I think we'd be, Kevin and Mike and I'd be certainly interested in doing another one of these in a couple, three weeks, if that would be helpful. Okay. And I do want to shout out to the county for Randy and they're stepping up and providing the dollars for the social, you know, uh, contact testing and things that they're doing that help this phase two opening happen sooner than later. So shouts to them. <clears throat> okay. And, uh, I will, I will go ahead and close it here then, unless anybody has any last minute comments. And you said a couple, three, I'm gonna go with two. We'll invite you back in two weeks. All right, great. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your day. Thanks, Colleen. Bye-bye. Thank you.